Leslie, share your screen that the people can, the students can see you. Do you realize I've met you in 2006? No. <laughs> and since then, we really so long, eh? <laughs> to respect each other in, in a collegial way, but also in a private way. And you've enhanced my life in so many facets and mentoring me as being your faculty librarian. And now you are a distinguished professor from the department. And um, you are also a co-editor of the collection Physical Disability and Sexuality, Stories from South Africa, published by Palgrave. So yeah, you can see why we ask Professor Swartz because he has such a vast knowledge on all the topics that he's, uh, he's going to talk about today. He's also editor-in-chief of the South African Journal of um, Science. And apart from all his prize winning uh, winnings and um, awards that he got in his psychology field, he uh, also uh, obtained his second PhD last year in creative writing in the English one. And, uh, could, uh, and you uh, wrote a memoir as part of your PhD that was really well accepted, How I Lost My Mother. And apart from that, you wrote um, Able Bodies a few years ago. So you are so versatile in all your talents. And I wish you luck um, with with all the other books that you're going to write, whether it's academically or in your private capacity. So thank you for everything, and we're looking forward to your speech. And over to you now. Well, thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's just see what we can do here. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, I just need to. For some reason, it's it's not, oh there we are slideshow from the beginning. Okay, um, can um, Marlene, can you see my screen? Yes, Leslie. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. No, well, thank you. It's 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 an absolute pleasure to to be here. Um, I have to say to everyone that, that any good things uh, that Marlene may say about me, I have to say about her. She's really been a, a good friend and a great help to me over a long time. I also have to correct something. Because I'm older than 65, I may no longer be a distinguished professor, um, according to the rules of the university. So I'm not a, I'm not a distinguished professor, but I think you could probably call me an extinguished professor. Um, but I'm still happy to be a professor at the at the university. Um, Malian, um, I don't know if people are going to um, ask uh, questions, or I, I don't mind being interrupted. I'm going to try and leave some time for for questions and so on. But I can't look at those while I'm talking. Okay, so, uh, so. Kefner is responsible for okay. that. Okay, so good. after your speech, he will he will communicate okay. the, the okay. questions to you. Okay. Okay. So if there's anything in between, just let me know. Um, I am using slides. Um, do we know, or if, if is there anybody on the call who has a visual impairment? Do do we do we know that? Or, I mean, please, uh, you know, just say that in the chat because then I'll I'll make sure that I make the the. Um, session uh, accessible to you. Otherwise, I'll assume that people are able to, to look at and read my slides. OK. All right. Well, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I um, I've, I've actually got the wrong. <laughs> sorry, as usual, I've got the wrong uh, uh, presentation on here. Um, so let, let, let me just fix all of that. Um, so sorry about this. I, I was busy. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry about this. I'm just having some trouble over here. Uh, let me go back to this. 
Um, okay, I've stopped. I've stopped sharing, and I'm not going to look for the right thing to 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 share. Uh, I'm just going to del delete the wrong one. Sorry about all of this. This is this is this is what happens when you when you're an old person like me. Okay. All right. Right, okay, from the beginning, I will now, sorry about this. Um, uh, okay, can people see this now? Ethics of scholarly writing a personal view. I hope so. If 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 you can't, please let me know. Okay, so um, I'm 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 going to be talking in uh, uh, in my capacity as somebody who works in the university. This is very personal. I do a lot of editing as as um, and I do a lot of writing, as Molian has mentioned. Um, so I'm currently the editor of South African Journal of Science. Um, I was the founding editor of the African Journal of Disability, and I'm on the editorial board of various other journals. Um, and I'm mainly going to be talking about um, writing uh, in in uh, academic journals. So, so when we talk about publication ethics, publication ethics is not the whole of research ethics. It's part of research ethics. And, but in many ethical codes, um, it's, it's not ethical to conduct research if you do not communicate the results of your research to the scholarly community. So that is seen as part of why, why do I, sorry, can you, was someone saying something? Please, please mute yourself. If, um, it's, uh, if, uh, if, if you can't hear me, obviously let me know. Um, it's not ethical to conduct research if you don't communicate the results to the scholarly community. So in fact, in order to be ethical as a researcher, you have to disseminate in some way through a thesis, through a publication, through presentation at conferences, and so on. Otherwise, why do for those of us who work with uh, humans, why do we waste people's time, sometimes upsetting them, if we're not going to use the knowledge that they give us? So this creates some some dilemmas that I've experienced as a as a teacher at this university. If a student, for example, has um, uh, collected their data but then abandons the degree, it remains my ethical responsibility as the supervisor to see that that material gets published. And I've, I've had to do this once or twice and it hasn't been been, uh, been fun. Now, in general, there, there, there are lots of, of ethical issues regarding research and information. And we are all going to be hearing a lot more about Papaya, or papaya, however you say it, about pr um, protection of personal information. Um, we are actually in the period at the moment for um, discussion on that act that that will affect all of the research that we do, including um, our publishing. Um, but even if you if you follow uh, ethical publication guidelines, if the research that you're reporting on is not ethical, your your publishing is not ethical. And um, as a journal editor, I have to take for granted that ethical approval has been obtained for the particular study that you might be rep reporting on and that you followed it. Many of you will be familiar with, um, I think it was two years ago now, it was 2018 or 2019, there was a big uh, scandal about a piece of research that was done at Stellenbosch University, which had to do with um, the cognitive capacity of uh, colored women. Eventually, the um, piece of research was retracted. Um, it was really very difficult for the university. Now, in fact, something that happened there had less to do with research ethics in some ways than with publication ethics, because the the study had re had been through the ethics process at Stellenbosch University. It had got ethical approval. What the authors ended up publishing on had not been covered by what was was um, agreed to by the um, by the research ethics committee. 
Um, so there were there there were problems there. So so in the publication process, there are many players in the publication process. All of us, I would imagine, are either already authors, people on this call, um, or would like to be. Some of us, many of us will be reviewers and some of us are editors. I'm focusing in this talk on ethical issues as they affect authors mainly. Um, I'd be happy to, to the, the obviously ethical issues as, as affect reviewers and editors and I'd be happy to take um, any kind of discussion on that. There are some useful resources and Marlene, I'm very happy to, to share a PDF of these slides with people if that's helpful. Um, the central one on publication ethics, and I'm going to be relying on it a lot, is what we call COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. Their website is at publicationethics.org. And then um, a very commonly used one is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And you'll probably find within your own discipline that there are guidelines in terms of ethical publication and disciplines do vary from, from uh, one another. Um, You'll also find that many publishers now, many good reputable publishers, also have guidelines on um, authorship and, and, uh, and uh, uh, ethical authorship. One of the key issues, the key dilemmas that uh, people face, particularly people who are new to publishing and are working as part of uh, teams of, of publishers, is the question of who, whose name, who's an author of, of a journal article. And here I'm going to quote the, uh, the medical editor's criteria. It's actually quite strict who may be an author. Every author has to meet all four of the following criteria. Substantial, substantial contributions to conception or design of the work or the acquisition, analysis or interpretation of data and drafting the work, in other words, writing or revising it critically for important intellectual content. That does not mean just looking at it and say, oh, I think it's okay. And final approval of the ver version to be published and agree agreement to be accountable for all aspects of the work, even those parts of the work that you yourself did not write, in ensuring that questions related to the accuracy or integrity of any part of the work are appropriately investigated and resolved. So those are the requirements to be an, 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 edit, an, an author. I'm sure many of you will have had experiences where those four criteria have not been met, and we're going to talk about, about some of those in a minute. But um, there are other kinds of contributions, but these are not contributions of authors. So there are what are called non uh, author contributions. And this again is straight from the ICJME. I've formatted it slightly differently and I've added my em em emphasis. The following people should not be authors and they do not qualify, in fact, to be um, contributors to authorship. People who got the funding. So if you're working in a lab where you're lucky enough to have the head of the lab who's got all the millions of rands that pays your salary, but the head of the lab actually had nothing to do with your particular study, with thinking about it, with writing this. The head of the lab is not technically an author, according to ethical guidelines. Somebody who generally supervises research or offers administrative research, like a head of department, is not, is not an author, nor is somebody who gives um, technical editing or language editing or, or proofreading. The, the contribution has to be conceptual and substantive in order to be an, an, an author. Um, and we have various ways of um, acknowledging the contributions by various um, uh, authors. Um, uh, and uh, what we have to do as authors when we are when we are publishing is we also have to get permission and i'm, I'm sorry the sl my slide on my side is cut off a bit um, but you you'll have access to the slides afterwards we have to get permission from people that we want to acknowledge written permission so editors are advised to require that the corresponding author obtain written permission um, to be acknowledged from all acknowledged individuals because 
I don't, I don't want, and it's happened to me before. In fact, my name has been put on, on articles I haven't written, um, and I haven't known about that. But I've also been acknowledged for work that I don't want to be acknowledged for. Um, another issue that that um, a lot of authors um, struggle with is the question of authorship order. Um, and there are many different conventions, and there's no one way to determine authorship order. So in, in some systems, authors' names are put alph alphabetical because my surname begins with SW. I always think, no, that's not very nice for me. The, the most common convention is um, that um, author, authors are, are mentioned in order of contribution. So the person who's done the most work, um, so generally speaking, when um, there are publications emanating from a thesis or a dissertation, um, that student will be the first author. Uh, and you know, usually the first author is the main author. But in different disciplines, there are there are different conventions, particularly regarding the last authorship. So in in medicine generally and in some of the sciences, the last author position is acknowledged to be the senior authorship. So it's often the person in whose lab the work was done, or they had to contribute. So it's quite a prestigious position. But in other disciplines, um, uh, people just go in order of, of contribution. So it depends on, on what discipline um, you, you have. When you are working as part of a team and you know that you're going to be writing together, there are a number of things that COPE, that's the publication ethics people, suggest, and I can't emphasize these things strongly enough. Generally speaking, around ethical issues and authorship issues and ownership issues, the general principle is try and talk about the principles in advance before you um, come to the actual actual disputes because it is if, if you start writing something and then you say oh who's going to be an author it's too late people are going to start fight, fighting so so what people need to do in general is to encourage and discuss an ethical culture around authorship in your particular unit there may be conventions so for example within the medical field when when i first started out my first job um, I'm a psychologist by training. I worked in a medical research unit. Um, my first job after I qualified. The convention then was if it, on every single paper that came out of a medical department, the name of the head of department had to be on that paper, regardless of whether she or he had ever seen the work, had anything to do with it. That was the convention at the time. It's no longer a medical convention. So don't just follow con conventions you know, that are around, but think about them. Think about what is um, ethical. Discuss authorship issues when you plan your research. Um, and if it's a big project, there should generally be a, a, a written down publication plan. And before you start writing any article, article. Think about authorship and, and discuss authorship with, with um, other people, particularly if you're a more junior person, because and I imagine that some of the people on this call are more junior, because you are the sorts of people who in some ways are, are most prone to having your arm twisted or not being able to say no. So try and discuss the principles beforehand. As I've mentioned, here's an example. I'll put examples later. Many of the journals have author services where they discuss how to do these, these things. So from an ethical point of view, there are a number of potential problems with authorship. And I'm, I'm just going to mention some of them. And I've put a little joke here from um, PhD Comics about the reality of who actually be, be, becomes author. Um, so what are some of the problems? Gift authorship. When you're grateful to somebody for, for having done um, uh, something for you, they've got you your job, or they've been very nice to you. So you so you give them authorship on your article as a gift. That sounds very nice, but it's actually not ethical. Another problem is ghost authorship. This used to be a very common practice, particularly in, in medical writing, where in fact many um, publications were written by professional writers, um, often employed by drug companies, for example, and then 
um, the NHMs would not would not be seen. So that the drug companies would employ somebody, for example, with a PhD in English, who would write up articles, but the names that actually went onto the paper were the names of various doctors. That's called ghost authorship. That's also um, unethical. Guest authorship is similar to to um, gift authorship, and I mean the, the way that this can really be abused is you can say to your friend. Oh, I'm going to put my name on 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 all of. I'm going to put your name on all of my articles, and please, will you put your name on all of my articles? Then we'll both have more publications. That's that's not allowed. Coercive issues around authorship are when, particularly junior authors, are pressured into um, doing things like ghost. Uh, 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 gift and guest authorship, where more senior people say, well, if you don't put my name on, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut off your funding, just, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you and so on. That I'm afraid uh, uh, does happen. It's not the rule, but it does, it does happen. And, and a really complicated and difficult issue that I've had to deal with recently is gatekeeper authorship. And what I mean by gatekeeper authorship is, say, for example, you're a researcher and you need access to a database and somebody else has that database and they've put some work into putting the database together, but um, they need to give you access to the, to the database. Um, Certainly, you would acknowledge them, you would thank them. There might even be, between different research groups, some financial arrangements about getting access to the database. But I've I've known instances, including one that I'm dealing with at the moment, where the person who has the database says, you may not have access to the to the database unless you give me authorship on the on the papers. And the papers that are being written are not in the area of ex expertise of the person who has who um is controlling access to the to the database, um, and actually they have no right um, to be an, an 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 author, and it places people in a very very difficult situation because they want to do the work, and sometimes people break the rules because they they want to do the work. These things are really you know um, quite uh, difficult. There are also lots of ways in which. Um, people game the system, and unfortunately, there are there are what we call perverse incentives uh, uh, in the research system. And I'm going to talk particularly about the South African system, but it is not unique to South Africa. It's really difficult for anybody anywhere in a way that's not going to be contested to measure the quality of research. So what do we do? We we focus on what we can easily measure, which is quantity, and you can see the the Dilbert cartoon there at the, at the bottom, one of my favorite ones. So in South Africa, we have the Department of Higher Education subsidy system. And we know that universities are very dependent on the system to get funding. What does that encourage? It encourages something called salami slicing. So salami slicing is when you cut your research down into tiny, tiny little bits and publish it in tiny little pieces in different journals, because each of those is going to count as a publication. And I had such a sad example of it this week. I, I reviewed a really excellent article for a journal recently. Um, it, it was really, really good, and I, I gave very good good uh, commentary. And the same journal came back to me, and it, it was absolutely clear that this next article, uh, sent in as a separate article, was um, from the same group. You could, you could tell for various reasons. And this thing that was sent to me was, was a sort of mixture of author's opinions. It, it wasn't properly evidence-based guidelines that were sort of plucked out of the air and so on. And my reaction to this was that this this felt to me like a form of salami slicing. There wasn't actually another article here, but the authors were under pressure to to put out some other article. So in fact, this for me, that stuff that comes from that particular research group, well, it's there's always going to be an, an unpleasant taste in my mouth about them because 
you know, they were sending this thing, and I, as, as a reviewer, I recommended that the uh, this second article from people who'd done this really excellent work uh, be rejected. Um, and in fact, it 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 was rejected. The other way that that people game the system is, um, I'm sure that you know, there is a list. It's on the library website of the accredited journals according to the Department of Higher Education and Training System. And in fact, you may work in a field where there is. The best journal is a new journal who's not on, which is not on the list only, uh, uh, for example. And actually, you should be publishing what is the best journal academically. Uh, accreditation is not a measure of, of quality. It, it tries to be, and it tries to exclude predatory journals, and we're going to talk about predatory journals later. But... Um, you know, just beware only going for the, the reason the university wants you only to go for accredited journals is they want some measure of quality, but only accredited journals bring in money. Um, then there, there are practices which, in fact, there's very little evidence for, but I've, um, I've certainly seen these practices. People will deliberately send their material to journals that they think are of poor quality because they believe that they're going to get an easy win, that um, they're going to um, hear back quicker from, from less prestigious journals, and so they'll be able to, to publish more. In fact, I know of no evidence that shows that journals which are low status give answers which are quicker than journals which are high status. And in fact, I've, in my experience, it's often been the other way around. Um, and it's also not always the case that if you send something to a bad journal, that they're going to accept it. In fact, one of the, one of the, the, the uh, uh, things that I do as a journal editor and also as a supervisor, I supervise a lot of PhDs and masters and so on, is I tend to, I try to avoid going for reviewers or for um, examiners who are inexperienced because it's often the less experienced people who are more critical. So I've certainly had, had experiences in my own publishing career of sending something for various reasons to a journal which is quite low status, having it rejected there and then sending to a higher status journal and having it actually accepted there. So, so um but it's 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 you know, try not to game game the system. What you're trying to do, many of you, I imagine, who are on this call, is is to build a credible research career. And if you're publishing a published by your own department or by your friend, and so on, that becomes clear quite quite quickly, and and people get to know about that. So so just beware short term solutions. Now. Um, the other issue that we all need to think about in uh, in publishing are questions of conflict of, of interest. Conflict of interest, according to COPE, are really when authors, reviewers, or editors have interests that are not apparent and may influence their judgment. They have been described as those which, when revealed later, would make a reasonable reader feel misled or deceived. So again, I work in the, the health field, and there's certainly examples where for example, research has been um, been paid for by a drug company, and then the medical authors will go will say, "Oh, we'll, we'll publish in a prestigious journal saying that you know this drug really works." But what they're not saying is that the um, what they're not saying is that the person who paid for for this work to be done is the is the drug company that's that's deception um, for those of you interested i'm just reading a, a a book called empire of pain which deals with the oxycontin uh uh epidemic and this was one of the things that 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 was 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 happening there are other really difficult questions um where where's the line between editing something and actually writing it. When is somebody who's doing editorial work actually an author? Anybody who's a supervisor, and this is not just a South African issue, will know that sometimes, and I have this dilemma myself, I'm working with a, with a student, would, the, would people just please check that you're, um, that you're muted, because I'm, I'm getting some feedback of people rustling papers and things, thanks. Um, Sometimes, you know, you, you help a student to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Um, 
And eventually it feels like you're writing it yourself. And of course, there are many supervisors, including me, who often get to a point where actually we think it would be much easier if we actually wrote the PhD or the article for, for the student, because it would be uh, much quicker. So there's a kind of fine line there, and it's not so easy to 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 know where the line is, but it's it's really you know important to kind of think about. And there are often questions about who actually owns the data and who owns the argument that is being put forward in the um, particular article that 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 is 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 uh, being written especially in situations where for example um, a student a graduate student may come into a project where um, the original idea was conceptualized 10 years previously the person who actually put that idea together is no longer here but remains part of the research team and so on the student may have thought of something um, about the work that the original person hadn't thought about then there you know the questions about like who's an author um, whose whose data are these, um, and so on, and all of these issues take on a particular flavour in our South African context. And I want to talk particularly um, about a number of of South African uh, issues. They're they're global issues, but they are realised in particular ways uh, for us in South Africa. First of all, anybody who works at Stellenbosch um, University knows that. Um, that uh, there's, there's a politics associated with language. And scholarly publishing is absolutely dominated by English, largely because of the dominance of the United States, and to a lesser extent Europe, but largely the dominance of the United States in, um, in scholarly writing. So that means if we think about it from a from a decolonial point of view or from a global rights point of view, the people who get to publish, or the people who are unfairly advantaged in some ways, are people like me. I, I grew up with English as a first language. I'm lucky. But some people have been excluded from education for a range of reasons. Um, I work in the field of disability studies. Some of the most intelligent people that I've worked with um, are people who, by reason of, of, of disability, um, are practically illiterate. Similarly, there are many people who on, the, on the basis of, of race and gender who get excluded from education. So the people who can write and meet those COPE criteria are people with certain kinds of privileges. It privileges people who are first language English. It privileges people who've got access. We know that there has been a suppression and exploitation of local and indigenous languages throughout the world. And many people in the field of ethics and publishing are saying, actually, we need some redress here. We need to, we need to reflect when we publish as authors, um, not, not just um, the words of those who are in in power and who have who have privilege and who have thing other things that come from privilege so the sense of authority and being able to write the confidence um, uh, to write and many of these things are much more difficult um, if for example um, in in my own experience of working for over 30 years with you know helping other people to write um, women often feel find it very difficult to write um, on the basis because they've 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 been brought up being told uh, you know that they that they don't have a voice there are issues of race there are issues of disability and class and so on so some people would argue particularly people doing community based work where there are collaborations between wealthier people in south africa or people from the global north and the global south no actually i I'm, I'm working with a field worker who is first language is Kasa who can't write in English, but actually this field worker can't can't look at the the um, the manuscript and so on and so forth, but has contributed conceptually to the way that this paper has been written. And some people would say, and I think there's a lot a lot to recommend this view, that that person should be an author because there's something going on that that person is excluded from authorship for a range of global. Um, um, unethical issues and, and inequities. So publication ethics as narrowly understood, if you sort of follow the COPE guidelines and so on, um, really in, in the South African context, we have to think about also other issues, 
and global redress and, and uh, access to knowledge, what's called epistemic access and epistemic justice. None of these things is easy. I have certainly been in a situation where um, I have worked on um, on this on this basis with um, somebody who wouldn't wouldn't have been an author under the usual circumstances they'd become an author they you know part of what happens then is 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 that person was then asked to talk at a conference tried to talk at the conference um, really didn't have the 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 kind of background and it, 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 it kind of backfired. So these things are really difficult, but we have to keep these issues alive if we are serious about the role of ourselves and our university in redressing issues around the um, politics of, of, of knowledge. And there may be some um, discussion about this. I think these are really important issues. Um, uh, a huge, huge issue um, for, for us publishing from South Africa um, is regards race, and um, I don't think you can see me at the moment, but in race and inverted commas and, and racial categories. So the first thing uh, that, that we need to think about is, um, do we need to mention race in an article? Sometimes it's, 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 it's not important. We need to recognize, and I recommend that all of you look at the primer, which was edited by Jonathan Janssen and, and Cyril Walters on race, science, and society, which came out recently. And there is a, I have to declare my conflict of interest. I have, I've contributed to two of the articles, uh, two of the chapters uh, in that book. But one of the things that that book deals with and deals with very well, I'm not referring to my, my um, own chapters, is that um, we have to distinguish between socio-political um, categories versus scientific categories. And there are particular issues for South Africans and uh, you know, for those of us working in the Western Cape in particular, um, using the word colored. Now, probably everybody on this call understands what I mean when I use the word colored, but we feel uncomfortable about it. And certainly, um, uh, journals that are based in the global north often feel very uncomfortable about use um, of this term. I have been told, as a South African author talking about a so-called coloured uh, community, that I must replace the word coloured with African-American, which is hilarious because I'm working in South Africa, because the word coloured in the United States um, um, is... Um, a, a, a term which was used disparagingly for, for people who would now like to be called African-American. It doesn't have the same meaning as here. I have also been told that I have to change the word colored to mixed race. I mean, this is absolute nonsense as far as I'm concerned and not scientific because th there are no pure races. I, I'm classified white, but I am I am mixed race. I've been told to change the word colored by an editor to a person of diverse or mixed ethnic origin. Well, I am a person of diverse or mixed ethnic origin. It is not the same as 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 colored. And there are, and there are indeed people like Reuben Richards and, and, and other authors who are um, working on First Nation issues in South Africa who will point out that not all colored people um, identify as mixed race. They may um, identify as San, as First Nations, and so on. I think, and I've, I've had to do this, and I've had to fight with editors of international journals, that we have to be assertive on this issue. So if we are using social categories in South Africa, we have to say to the editors of journals, we, we, we can, uh, people can look at the stuff that I've written, but we have to explain what we mean, but the, these these categories still have put, they are legal categories in South Africa. They, they, it is in the current labor relations, the, all the labor legislation in South Africa. It's in the Employment Equity Act. The, you know these words that we don't like: colored, African, all of them, Indian, white, whatever, remain very important in South Africa. They they not scientific categories. They're not genetic categories, etc. We have a responsibility when we write to, to indicate that and to indicate why we are using these terms. It is not ethical, in my view, simply to remove them. So, unfortunately, I know a South African ex South African author who is now based in the United States, and I happen to be looking at this person's CV. 
And this person was writing articles um, a long time ago during apartheid about colored people in, uh, I, I won't give details because I don't, I don't want to reveal. This person has changed their CV and just removed the word colored because they're now in, um, in North America. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's not ethical. That 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 was in the title of of their article. They can choose to remove it from their CV. They they can they can put a footnote indicate on, on their CV indicating how they used it. But simply just to remove it, to me, um, is is highly uh, problematic. I'm not going to say a lot about. Uh, plagiarism because you know, there are plenty of workshops on plagiarism, but it is the most com one of the most common reasons in my experience as an experienced editor why we reject things. You cannot believe the amount of plagiarism we get. Turn it in or authenticate does not actually measure plagiarism. It's, it's, uh, it's not uh, perfect. Some of the things to think about in terms of plagiarism are self-plagiarism, where you're using words that you that that you've used in previous articles, but you may be doing it deliberately because you're salami slicing. It's actually okay to copy from your own thesis or dissertation for a journal article, but but acknowledge this. Put put that that thesis or dissertation in your reference list. They they're much more. Um, fundamental questions like, can you plagiarize people's ideas? And I, I always think about a, a colleague I used to know some years ago who would take junior colleagues out to lunch. Um, and then those ideas that they discussed over lunch would appear in um, in journal articles. In fact, there's, a, there's quite a important formulation of a term which that person claimed for themselves, but actually came from, from one of these lunches. That's, that's also plagiarism. Uh, it's plagiarism of ideas, and it's it's much more serious than than making uh, mistakes. Now, many of you will have got um, uh, emails of the following: um, I'm an advocate, and I want to give you money. Uh, I'm the son of the petroleum minister, um, and we also get anybody who's published gets the um, the academic example. You know, consider this as a reminder. I'm, I'm Leslie Swartz. I know nothing about hydrology, but I, I get asked to, to publish things in a hydrology journal. Um, uh, I, uh, an obligatory submission to the physical medicine. So I get these every single day of my life. These are examples of um, what we call predatory publishing. Now, I'm going to insult people. Predatory publishing. Um, is a huge industry. It's targeted specifically at people in countries like our own. And really, what what you can publish any rubbish at all, as long as you pay them, it will get into what looks like an academic journal. And I, I, um, I have to give you a warning. There are swear words on on the next two slides because I just want to show you an example of an article which was actually published. So if you're offended by swear words, please brace yourself because it, there are swear words coming up in the next two slides. So these authors decided that they were going to see, they were going to push predatory publishing. And this article was published called Get Me Off Your Fucking Mailing List. It had a lovely uh, 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 little drawings in it, but clearly, you and I do not want to be part of this predatory publishing. So how do we recognize predatory publishers? I don't have time to, to get into this in, in detail. There is a list of, of potentially predatory journals and, and publishers, uh, uh, Beale's list. Um, if people send you things wanting to publish your PhD as a book or inviting you, it's generally speaking, it's, it's predatory. The, the huge problem with predatory publishing is it's building and abusing another very important ethical um, issue, which is the issue of, of open access. Open access publishing is very important and it's ethically very important. And I'll tell you in a minute why Stellenbosch is so central to all of this. We live in Africa where many, many people, including people based at, at, at universities, 
can't get access for monetary reasons. They can't get access. The, the, the universities haven't got the money to subscribe to expensive journals. So open access changes the payment model. Somebody has to pay. Um, instead of the, the um, libraries paying, the people who are writing the articles pay um, what are called page fees. And this, the, um, this is done legitimately in um, all of the journals in the in the PLOS series, like PLOS Medicine, uh, Biomed Central. Um, I used to be the editor of the African Journal of Disability. I'm very lucky because South African Journal of Science is open access. The only reason we don't have to charge um, our... Um, uh, contributors open access is we have a government grant where we're, we're very lucky but open access is is really really important um, and it's part of global eth ethics so in 2003 there was a a um, declaration made in in uh, in berlin which which um, said essentially that that if information isn't widely made available to society as a whole to everybody in the world, including people who don't have access to rich universities like Stellenbosch University, then we have a problem in terms of, of um, global access. And I, I am extremely proud that the first South African university to embrace open access really vigorously was Stellenbosch University. And in fact, we have open access weeks every week. But many of you will know um, we have currently at the university this year already run out of the open access funding, which I think is a, a huge problem. And um, I have asked to be taken taken up through my um, faculty. I've also um, written to the vice rector in charge of research. We have to have an enabling environment where we as African scholars are able to publish in such a way that people in Africa have access to what we write. Part of that comes from open access publishing. And when we write our research grants and go for research money, we must always have a line item in there to pay for, um, for uh, page fees. Um, sorry, I do want to leave a bit of time for, for discussion. I've taken a bit longer than I thought, but we, we're coming to some final thoughts again. Here's an author services page uh, from Taylor and Francis. Many of the, the um, publishers have these. Okay, so in summary, we all face ethical dilemmas. They don't go away. Okay. Um, I, you know, it's easy for me to say, do this, do this, don't do that. But you're going to be in situations where you, you, um, you're not going to, to be able to resolve things. And that's just a reality. It's important for all of us to take a, uh, to take responsibility to create a culture where we discuss ethical difficulties and other difficulties um, in our research. Nobody's perfect. Nobody has has all of the answers. Um, so it's it's good wherever you are to try and have a culture in which people can talk to one another about the, the, the dilemmas that they face. They, they're often complicated. My experience being at Stellenbosch University, I think it's a huge strength of our university in terms of ethics, is that um, you can go to our research ethics committees, depending on which environment you are, you might the social and behavioral ones, the health or whichever, and you can go to them and say, look, I have a dilemma. Um, you know, can people on your, your committee help me? Um, before you publish or, or um, uh, uh, you know, during the, pr the process. So ma make use of, 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 of that, that resource. And we all make mistakes. Um, so um, you know, if, for example, there, there may be people on this call who've been caught by predatory publishers before, um, it's not the end of the world, just never do it again. <laughs> um, so it's really how we, we handle and learn from our mistakes that counts. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes now for, um, for uh, discussion. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss or go back on, on anything that, um, uh, you know, uh, wasn't um, clear. So for the moment, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um,
so that people can see me. Um, are there any questions so far? Or comments or objections? Um, Somebody said the you know, B, um, you know, Beale's list. In, in fact, the the I, I could just see something. Um, I checked Beale's list this morning, and in fact, there is a new update on Beale's list. It it stopped being updated because, in fact, Beale was. I'm just looking. I'm responding to this this issue in the chat. Um, Beale. Um, there's a whole story behind what happened with with Beale and so on. But in fact, I saw, I saw a very recent uh, update on Beale's list today. And in fact, one of the, one of the issues right at the bottom of that, and uh, uh, that I was looking at this morning as I was updating and, and preparing for the lecture, is there's there's a new sort of giant or, or elephant in terms of academic publishing, which is MDPI who who um, are charging a huge amount in terms of author fees. Um, and Beale has not put it on as predatory, but has said to look carefully at, and I have myself have published in, in, in journals in the stable, um, he's, it's, but, but have a look at some of the practices that may be going on with this new giant player on the scene. I just happened to look at that this morning. I, I'd, I'd, and I did that deliberately because of the, of the problem with Beals list not being updated. General, but as a general um, principle, in terms of how do I know whether a journal is predatory or not? First of all, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And look really carefully at who's on the editorial board and so on. If if hugely important and 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 um, famous people are on the editorial board, write to email them. I mean, I've had the situation of there was a predatory conference in Cape Town, where all these famous famous people were supposed to be on the scientific committee. So I wrote to all of them, and I said, "Why are you on the scientific committee of this predatory conference? None of them had ever heard of it. The, the people who were just organising it had just put their names down." Yeah. So um, yeah, thank you for that comment. Any anything else? People are free to raise a hand, say something, <laughs> anything. <laughs> What have I left out, Malia? Oh, Leslie, there's so much. You can talk and talk <laughs> forever. So I think um, there's a lot to to take in and to to um, go back to again. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else that would like to say something? Okay, this session will is recorded. It will be available and sent to everybody who registered, Leslie. So then, students, um, uh, the the register the the uh, participants will go back and maybe can contact you if they need any other assistance that I can think of. Um, this will this recording will also be on our YouTube channel from the library. I think we get a lot of thanks. This is very useful presentation. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, thank you. So, Leslie, you've done well. <laughs> thank you so much. And um, if the, the PowerPoint, if you send it to us, I'll, that I'll will see. also be shared um, with all the participants. Um, so, uh, yeah, so grateful to have this chance to listen to you, Professor. <laughs> Uh, well, thank, thank you, thank really you everyone. Interesting. So <laughs> I think um, I think everybody's in awe of all your knowledge I and know, what you know. know, and they can maybe contact you if they need anything else from you. And thank you for your willingness. Within a half an hour after I've asked you to do this presentation, you said yes. So oh, well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, Marlene. I mean, one thing that I just want to say is that I, I don't know if there's anybody on this call who who knows, but I mean, I'm I'm particularly because I'm you know as as old as I am and I've been around the block. I do take mentoring really seriously. I run the the I'm the academic coordinator of the early career academic development program in the university, and this is deliberate. This is what I like to do. So don't be shy to contact me. 
um, my name is is on the system. If you, if I don't um, answer you immediately, it's also because I'm old. I, f I forget things. Just just contact me again. I, I will never not get back to you because I think what you've said is stupid or any of those sorts of things. Um, it's, it's it's it'll be because um, I miss things. So I, I do want to encourage you. I'm sure that there are things that I said today. I was rushing through in order to have to make time. Um, there are things that may not be clear or there, or there are dilemmas that you may have. Um, I do, one of the things I love most about my job is being able to, to help other people who, who are less experienced than me. So don't be shy. And uh, it's always a pleasure. I'll do anything for Malian because she's wonderful. That's the other thing is ask Malian things because Malia knows a huge amount. So thanks very much. Every no, it's absolutely true, Malian. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, and good good luck for the rest of the day. Thank you so, for the presentation. Same to you. And same okay. To you. Thank, Thank you for bye. your knowledge and experience came through wow. now. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, Leslie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.